Let me show you a couple of case studies where people are, are using bioconjugation. And while, while I say where bioconjugation is vitally important uh, in, in generating the results they want. The first case study I hear is, I've got here rather, uh, is using an antibody drug conjugate. And essentially some investigators uh, conjugated a humanized antibody um, and uh, to a given drug. And let me work from this particular image on the right hand side. So we've got a human T cell here that expresses this particular antigen CXCR4. The investigators were trying to get this particular drug that's made by our friends at Bristol Myers Squibb to be a little more selective uh, in the way it does uh, target uh, its particular antigen or an, an uptake in that given cell type. So it's not particularly specific, the drug. Uh, so the investigators were thinking, well, you know what? If we target this particular uh, expressed antigen on these human T cells with an antibody, we conjugate the antibody, and they did that using cellular link conjugation chemistry to this drug, it can then get incorporated into the cell and work on these particular uh, you know, tyrosine kinase uh, pathways and affect T cell activation. So hopefully that makes sense. So the drug itself actually is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And so by using the specificity of that antibody to bind to that target antigen, and they did studies to, to uh, identify that once it binds to that uh, antigen, it actually does get incorporated inside the cell and therefore acts specifically. And because it has that drug payload, there it can actually act in situ in that given cell. And so I thought that was a pretty neat way of looking at, at uh, bioconjugation. And uh, I'd call it, actually I did, I did read somewhere, someone called it a vectorized, or I'll call it targeted chemotherapy, uh, rather than a whole systemic chemotherapy. This is directed toward a given cell type and antigen. So I think this is pretty neat. And uh, there are now, I think, in our last count, around about 80 or so antibody drug candidates uh, using various you know, bioconjugation methodology uh, under evaluation uh, by the FDA. So pretty neat stuff that's going on there with, with bioconjugation. Here's another one. Uh, it's where they use bioconjugation that with the soil technology. Uh, DNA antibody barcoded arrays. These particular investigators uh, uh, developed this platform called a MIST platform, a multiplex in situ ta targeting, excuse me, tagging platform, uh, whereby they had a monolayer of single stranded DNA microbeads uh, on, I think this was like a glass surface, if I remember correctly. But these are all immobilized, they're in the one place, and they've got a different single strand on them. That's the idea of the, of the colors there. But by using bioconjugation, what they did was attach uh, complementary DNA uh, to antibodies that then hybridized to those single strands, which allowed these antibodies specifically to capture uh, different proteins in solution. And then using a fluorescent sandwich ELISA, they could quantify that. Uh, later on in the study, if you're going to look at it, uh, they actually then eluded off the, those um, complementary uh, DNA strands, and they could do several rounds or multiple rounds uh, of detection. So this allowed them to do high throughput with high sensitivity. But it was this conjugation of the antibody uh, with that complementary DNA strand that allowed them to undertake this given methodology. Okay, one more uh, case study we'll look at that might be of interest to investigators out there. Uh, this was uh, actually just came out last year, and these investigators really wanted to develop a straightforward method to, to probe or investigate tumor heterogeneity without going the way of what I will refer to as maybe a, a, a complicated, complex, and indeed a high cost platform uh, that I know are out there. And what these investigators did was they developed uh, what they referred to as a, a cyclic or a cyclic immunofluorescence methodology. Basically, they conjugated 14 different antibodies, 
two oligos, oligonucleotides, and they and they put these particular uh, oligonucleotides down on the tissue at the one time. So there was not subsequent uh, incubations of separate different antibodies. There's 14 antibodies with defined oligonucleotides, unique oligonucleotides on the tissue at the one time. And then they put on a complementary fluorophore oligo strand and did some uh, visualization and, and uh, identification with that. Because it also had a photocleavable linker, if you remember back, we did uh, talk about spacer arms and how they could have an option of having a cleavable arm. Uh, this one was a photocleavable arm uh, or linker arm uh, that they could break off using UV light exposure. And then for that allowed them to do reprobing uh, later on uh, with some other targets. So this actually uh, is a very neat way for those of you out there uh, who may be doing multiplex immunofluorescence or things like that. Some of you might be thinking, hey, there's no secondary antibodies here. And that's exactly right. These investigators were not uh, hobbled, if you will, or hamstrung by having to use defined anti-mouse or anti-rabbit or anti-goat secondary antibodies and constrained with those parameters. They utilize these antibody oligo conjugates and these unique complementary strands, and they uh, didn't have to worry about uh, secondary antibodies. So I think that was pretty neat. And this is certainly going to be uh, something that's developed forward. And I, and I do believe that, that other platforms are very similar out there at the moment. So hopefully this gives you some idea about how bioconjugation uh, is being used out there. And it, it's certainly coming to prominence in a lot of methodologies. Okay, so we've just had a look at some interesting case studies. Let's have a dive now into the Solulink chemistry. And the question I've got here, what is Solulink bioconjugation? And let me walk you through this slide. It's really a couple of different steps, but it involves the use of this molecule called Hynek and another molecule called 4FB. And obviously there are abbreviations for much longer chemical names. But nonetheless, uh, let's break it down a bit and we'll use the example we've been using uh, since uh, pretty much the first slide here in the webinar. Here's our antibody. And we've got to conjugate this enzyme horseradish peroxidase to it. So for the Solulink conjugation, first off, you attach Hynek to the antibody. And in a separate step, you attach 4FB to the enzyme. So they're two separate steps and you do those number one. And once they're done, once they're performed, then you mix them together and given the high affinity of the high neck for the 4FB, that linkage, you get essentially this bioconjugate. Peroxidase, anti-mouse, I just made that up. It could be anything you want. It could be a primary antibody, a secondary antibody. But the idea being that you've got a peroxidase conjugated antibody. And the nuts and bolts, the, the heart of the Solulink bioconjugation chemistry is the use of this Hynek and 4FB molecule to link together and form these bioconjugates. All right, just take a deep breath. Another couple of chemical structures here, but I think this is important just to get into it a little bit more. Uh, here's the high neck molecule right here. Uh, this particular uh, end uh, reactive group will bind to the amines uh, on the antibody and similarly on the 4FB uh, that will bind uh, target amine groups on this particular enzyme, the peroxidase. And some of you might be looking at this 4FB molecule and just thinking, hey, didn't we see that on the glutaraldehyde? And the answer is yes, you did. So this is actually an aromatic aldehyde that links to an aromatic hydrazine. And with under certain conditions, once they're you know, bound to their given targets there, they give you this particular bioconjugate. And interestingly, you'll see right in the middle here is this hydrazone chromophore. And the idea here of the graphs to show you, you can actually use that or utilize that uh, linkage, that chromophore in the linkage uh, to identify that, yes, it actually has been conjugated and how much is there. 
All right, so we're using this particular example as a, again throughout the webinar just to get some of these concepts across. So again, here's our antibody, here's the peroxidase enzyme, here's the linker, and this particular linker using Hynek 4FB has this hydrozone bond that enables quantification of that actual linkage to occur. And so that's one of the, the key benefits uh, or advantages of using the solulink chemistry is that you can quantify how much material is bound to your biomolecule. And I've listed here some of the other features or advantages of the solulink chemistry. Certainly, these the, the reactions occur under relatively mild conditions, and that's very important. What I mean by that is it's not at extremes of pH, not high alkalinity or, or very low pH. Uh, because you know, certainly if you are working, I used the word labile before, you know, with some or delicate, if I'll use that phrase, maybe that's a little better, some delicate specimens, uh, you want to retain maximum activity or binding activity. And certainly for antibodies, you want them to bind to their target antigen. Uh, you don't want to break them up or things like that. So that's very important. Some other linking technologies can be rather, rather harsh and you do lose activity. So just be aware of that. Uh, some of the binding uh, gets very close to 100% in terms of its labeling efficiency. If you selected or chose a linking methodology that only put a linkage on 10% of your biomolecule, you're obviously using, losing, I should say, about 90% of your biomolecule, and, and that's going to flush down the, the sink, and, you, and you'll lose a lot of that. So you really want a high efficiency labeling methodology, which this is. You also want it to work relatively quickly. You don't want to be sitting around for hours to have the, the linkage occur. So indeed, solulink chemistry incorporates a catalyst called aniline, which drives the reaction very quickly to uh, form that conjugation. Stability too is, is a key factor, and I hinted on that earlier on. Under the considerations for uh, bioconjugation, you want the certainly the reagents and and the conjugates to be stable once formed. And certainly, you know, a year in storage at four degrees is a very good time uh, for a bioconjugate. Consistency between lots is pretty crucial, particularly if you're trying to duplicate studies. Scalability, if, you, if you're going to amp it up instead of just, uh, you know, a very small, you know, maybe you know, milligram amounts, you want to go to, um, or microgram amounts rather, you want to go to milligrams or even gram quantities. Uh, certainly that's a methodology you can consider or an approach. And we did mention quantifiable, but also it's very versatile and flexible. It can be used in many applications. And if you think back to uh, the slide we mentioned about the bioconjugate applications with the image of the cell layer, all of those particular methodologies we listed, flow cytometry, microscopy, etc. you know, these, this particular bioconjugation methodology can be used in those studies. All right, let's have a dig now into the Solulink product portfolio. And I did mention earlier on, we're going to be looking at the kits themselves or focusing on the kits. 